All right, so I'm now recording. Uh, so basically what this study is intended for is it's going to be presenting, uh, it's like a question and answer thing. And my religion is the Dead Sea Scrolls. I, I've tried to uh, follow as best I can the ancient religion of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Obviously, some of the Dead Sea Scrolls are fragmentary, so it takes interpretation, and perhaps some of my interpretation is not entirely accurate, but for the most part, I believe what I have reconstructed, the faith I have reconstructed, is very close to the faith of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And so for those who are curious about uh, what the Dead Sea Scroll religion has to say about different uh, questions people have, it's very important to see what the what the other side has to say because most of the time uh, in messianics and in the Hebrew roots movement, you're hearing you're hearing people uh, teachings, but you're, it's primarily from rabbinic Judaism, Pharisee. You're always hearing the Talmud stuff, and it, it's all questions and answers from that perspective. But so I present a very fresh approach which helps you who are seeking truth kind of see another way to look at uh, the scriptures that's very different from what everyone else is saying uh, and you know, I leave it to you guys to uh, figure out if what I'm saying is true or not but it's presenting the faith of the Dead Sea Scrolls and answering your questions whatever you have so what we're basically going to be doing is anyone who is on this call uh, can type their questions in the box uh, provided on the site and then I'm going to be answering each of these questions and it can be on any topic and uh, about the scriptures that is or uh, and uh, I, as if I'm understanding correctly Jackson has a lot of a lot of people with him so if you can Jackson uh, you can ask the people there if they want to, if they have questions and they can submit the questions to you and you can type them or you can have, you can have them take turns typing questions, uh, whichever works. But that would be great to have some uh, interaction from the people in your group as well. So with that said, I will... I will basically begin, but first I'm just going to wait for some questions to come in because no one has put any questions here. Uh, so once I start seeing questions, I'll start trying to answer to the best I can. And also, if you know, if there's not really any questions, then I'll just start because I have a lot to share for my own. Uh, from my own studies. So, uh, all right, that's a good first question. All right, let's see here. All right, so it looks like that's the complete question that you, you gave. <laughs> okay, so the question that was asked is, what was the relationship between the Zadokites and Pharisees in the first century BC. So, in my understanding, you've got, you know, you've got all the other religions who, of course, they worship their gods, or whatever. Then you've got the religion of the Bible, or the religion of not Judaism, but you know, the the faith of the Old Testament, the centered on the law of Moses. And there's all the different groups. And so basically the main divisions of Judaism started becoming more and more separate and distinct from one another, in my understanding, in about the second century BC, perhaps a little bit early, earlier than that, or maybe a little bit later. It's 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 a rough estimation, but around that time, around the time of the Maccabees was really when the different groups of Judaism uh, broke apart and the 
the Zadokites, or you know, the, the Zadokites, that's a term that scholars use to refer to the writers of the Dead Sea Scrolls, or the the, the, the group of Jews that were were responsible for the Dead Sea Scrolls. And it wasn't just a small group. It, there was there were a lot of uh, these Jews all throughout Israel. And so uh, they started separating from one another over doctrinal differences, over theological differences, and over uh, differences of what they consider scripture. And but so in my understanding from my studies, the the Pharisees and the Zadokites, or as I refer to the Zadokites, I refer to them as the Essenes, the the Essenes and the Pharisees were actually much closer to each other, generally speaking, than the Sadducees were to either group. The Sadducees, from what I've seen, were uh they had much less in common with both groups. However, the Sadducees, uh, their their interpretation of the law was stricter and more in line with the Essenes or the Zadokites. And they're called Zadokites by scholars because uh, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the, the phrase sons of Zadok occurs very often. And... Uh, in reference to the priesthood, and Zadok is related to Sadducee, and some of the legal positions or some of the interpretations of the law in the Dead Sea Scrolls are the same that the Sadducees had. We know this because the Pharisees in, in their rabbinic writings tell us some of the beliefs of the Sadducees. And so uh, there were some similarities between the Sadducees and the Essenes or the Zadokites. Uh, they were, it was more of, of how they interpreted the law. They were much more faithful to the law, the plain text of the law, and the Pharisees tried to find loopholes to make the law easier uh, to keep and also to find ways of getting around certain things or taking advantage of other people and benefiting themselves. Uh, and, uh, but then the theology. The theology of the Essenes or the Zadokites was closer to the Pharisees. They had they shared more emphasis on what happens in the afterlife, a similar understanding. Uh, their views on free will and predestination were much closer to each other than the uh, the, the Sadducees were. Uh, so there was a lot more. There were major differences, but there were also some strong similarities which the Pharisees and the Essenes uh, were united on. And so that is why you can see in the New Testament, which I believe the Messiah was a Zadokite or an Essene, but he goes and interacts with some of the Pharisees and they have a common ground. So there is a... Uh, There are many similarities to be appreciated, and they are not so different enough that they cannot be grouped together. They, they are similar enough that when considering them, they are, are, they are appropriate to consider together, like almost like uh, cousins in a sense. Uh, so hopefully that gives a, a uh, good enough, uh, very, you know, broad... Uh, explanation of the differences but of course there's just so much more in depth on to really fully understand how they re relate to one another you have to really understand what they taught each group and then compare the differences so there's so many differences but in the midst of those differences there is a common ground that is strong and parallel to both that that unites them so hopefully that answers the question what other questions are there
And 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 Jackson, uh, also people in your group. You have you have a lot of people in your group. So if anyone in the group wants to ask a question, just feel please feel free to have one of them ask ask anything for those who are listening. Uh, but uh, we have Luke here who is asking who wants to ask a question. So please share what you what is on your mind. Just waiting for the question. And if there are certain instances where in, in these studies where people just don't really have the questions, then I'll just start sharing things on my mind that, uh, that I feel are important to, to share with you all because there's just so much uh, things. Okay, so I'm going to answer this question, and if Luke, you are still asking your question, please ask, uh, and others ask their questions. You can ask your questions right now while I'm talking. That would really help, because instead of having long pauses, I'd have these questions already there. So if you can, like Jackson, if you have people who are wanting to ask questions, can you type in the questions while I'm uh, answering other questions? That, that would make it uh, more use of our time. So, but I'm going to ask the first question, answer the first question here was, was Yeshua in a scene? In other words, uh, was he, was the Messiah in a scene? And from, from what I've studied, there are so many striking similarities with what the Messiah taught in what the Dead Sea Scroll writers taught that if the Dead Sea Scroll writers were a scene, which I believe they were, uh, that, then uh, that makes a strong, compelling case for Yeshua being in a scene as well, because uh, the closer your beliefs are to a particular group, the more likely you're identified with that group. So there's some striking differences between between what Yeshua taught and what the Pharisees taught. There's so many differences when you start looking into it. You'll find pro-Pharisees. There's a lot of uh, Messianics who are very pro-Pharisee and they're very rabbinic. They like to use the Talmud. But these people, uh, they kind of like to twist or they find common ground. Because as I said, there is common ground between the Pharisees and the Essenes. So they're, they're appealing to common ground that Yeshua had with the Pharisees. Uh, as support that Yeshua was essentially a Pharisee. <clears throat> but when you look deeper at Yeshua's teaching, you'll see there's too many things that he was teaching that are just completely contrary to what the Pharisees were saying, the, the, the main Pharisee teachings, whereas when you look at the Dead Sea Scrolls and what was attributed to these scenes, there are some really amazing things that just cannot be denied. Uh, let me just give an example. This is not in the New Testament, but this is in uh, well, this is not in our New Testament, but this is in the Ethiopian New Testament. And just uh, to explain a little bit about the, about the Ethiopian Bible, the Ethiopian Bible is the only church group that has preserved for us the Book of Enoch and the Book of Jubilees and an extra Jeremiah book that's in no other uh, church Bible. Well, what do we have in the Dead Sea Scrolls? We have that Book of Enoch. We've got the... Uh, book of Jubilees and we've got an extra Jeremiah book in there and so somehow the Ethiopian church their Bible is very similar to the Bible in the Dead Sea Scrolls so there's a strong connection there then when you see their New Testament their New Testament has eight extra books so 35 books of their New Testament and in those eight extra books there's a lot of teachings that the Apostles have and that Yeshua has and these teachings are strikingly connected to the Essenes, like so much more. Like, uh, just to give one example, the Dead Sea Scrolls teach uh, a three-year conversion process for someone who wants to become a, a full member of their religion. Three years to convert to the, to the Essene religion or to the Dead Sea Scroll religion. That's what the Dead Sea Scrolls teach. And Josephus also says that's what the Essenes taught. Well, strikingly, in these writings, 
in the in the Ethiopian Bible, the Messiah and the apostles say three years are required for the conversion process. But then they say, however, if the person is uh, very learned and doesn't need that much time because they are they're just they can get it so much easier, then they can be accepted sooner. And they explain because it's not it's not necessarily the time, but it's the quality of the learning that's being done. But the problem is most people have don't have the ability to learn so quickly and so well so soon. It takes a longer time for most people. They have a lot more responsibilities, families they have to feed, take care of. Uh, someone like me, I have almost all the time in the world to just study all the time compared to other people who have to work almost all day to feed their children. They're not going to have as much time to figure, to learn what the truth is. So that's why the three year conversion process is given to give them enough time to learn and to, to understand what the terms are before they convert to the faith. Because once you convert, when you, if you turn away, that's worse than if you had, uh, had never converted. So, uh, so there's things like that, you know, like that's, that's amazing coincidence right there. Like three year teaching the, the Pharisees never taught that they never taught a three year conversion process, but we had, we see right here, the Messiah and the apostles are saying that and the Dead Sea Scrolls are saying that. And there's just so many other examples that, you know, it would take a long time to go through them all. But w once you go one by one and see all the things, you just become convinced that he has to be an Essene. Did he disagree with some of the Essene beliefs? Did he disagree with some of the Dead Sea Scroll teachings? Possibly. But think about this for a second. If he disagreed with like tons of Pharisee stuff, and then he disagreed with a little bit Essene stuff, then he's still basically in a scene, even if he disagrees slightly. Because it, think about it, you know, you have you have uh, you have the groups today, believers today, they're part of all different religious groups, but yet they do not have a, an agreement on everything. Pretty much no two people, if you find any two people in a group or a church or, you know, community, they won't have an agreement on theology, they won't have a full agreement on how to keep the law. There's so many differences you're going to find between just two different people, let alone an entire congregation. So even if you can find some differences, which I would contest, I would try to defend uh, that Yeshua did not disagree with the Dead Sea Scrolls at all. But even if you can find some disagreements, that does not refute all the other amazing agreements that are out there that just really point to him being extremely close to, if not identical, to a full-fledged scene uh, Jew. Uh, so that I hopefully that was sufficient answer for that question. Now, uh, okay. So here's a question about how about the Sabbath? Uh, Dave, David's asking this. He says, how about the Sabbath? I was just slammed for talking about it. I was told the Sabbath is rest. And if uh, you want to worship on Sunday, that's totally different. So basically, uh, the, the command in the scriptures is to rest on the seventh day and to keep it holy. We see that in Genesis. We see that in, throughout the law. And in the Ethiopian Bible, it tells us that all believers, all people who follow the Messiah, are also required to keep the Sabbath. But we're also told in the Dead Sea Scroll uh, writings, or at least according to Josephus, what the Essenes believed was daily worship. You were to worship daily together. So I find it uh, a little bit like the question of what day should we worship is almost a, a false question because really we should be worshiping with our community group, our uh, synagogue or whatever, you know, the, the fellowship that you are a part of, whichever place you live. It's supposed to be every day. That, that's the problem with uh, all these other groups is that they don't have a community mindset. The Essenes had that community mindset, and the early believers, as we see in the New Testament and the Ethiopian New Testament, 
had that mindset of share everything with each other, uh, share all your resources, share your time, and the place you live. Everything you 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 the best you're able to do all together as much as you can to help each other out because you're a family. Uh, if you know you're you work together as brothers and sisters in the faith, and so the idea is this this is the perfect ideal obviously this cannot be done for all believers because we're so spread out right but uh for those who are able to gather together the the ideal that the dead sea scrolls teaches and that the the new testament writings and the apocryphal writings teach and that is you you have everyone living in a tightly uh knitted community and they all have their different jobs they're they're focused there's like a, a couple there's a few leaders who run who have management over the entire community but they're you know they there's checks and balances in place so that they don't uh, abuse the people and abuse their power and um, and every day of your life uh, you are immersed into the community of your brothers spiritual brothers so you are encouraging one another all the time you are Helping each other every day with the work you have to do, help each other to, to eat healthily, lawfully, you know, uh, pure food and pure jobs. You're, you're all helping each other to survive. And uh, that's really the emphasis. So when you have that emphasis, you gather together every day in worship. That's what they were teaching that we were supposed to do. So there is really no issue of worshiping on a Sunday and any day of the week. Uh, but you know the, the scriptures clearly teach that the seventh day is the Sabbath of the creation and that was never changed there's no indication in scripture that that ever was changed or that that ever could be changed now according to the the Dead Sea Scroll writings new holy days can be added so there's you know discussion of are there any new holy days we have to keep that are not mentioned in the law uh, for, for you know for one example the Book of Esther teaches the Purim, for instance. The, the Maccabees books teaches the Hanukkah. And when you go to the Book of Jubilees, it tells us how each of the holy days was originated. It didn't originate with Moses. It originated with uh, each of the patriarchs for special events. Uh, Noah in introduced the Shavuot. And he introduced the four special uh, new month days, falsely called by others new moon days. Uh, these were four holy days uh, that Noah introduced, that the law also tells us to keep. And then Abraham introduced the seven days of unleavened bread, and he introduced tabernacles, the, the Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkot, which we're doing right now. Abraham was the one who did that, according to the Book of Jubilees. And uh, Jacob, he introduced the Day of Atonement, and the eighth day, the day after Tabernacles, uh, that final day was introduced by, by Jacob, according to Jubilees. And Jubilees was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's, it was considered scripture by the Dead Sea Scroll writers. So we're seeing that the, the holy days were added gradually based on a holy event. Something holy happened, and a new day was added. So it is possible for new Sabbath days to be added, I believe, according to these teachings, according to these books. But can old holy days be done away with? No. There's no teaching in scripture which suggests that these holy days would be would be replaced, removed. Uh, the these holy days are promised in scripture in Jubilees and in other in in the Old Testament to remain forever. These holy days will be we are to keep them forever, for all generations. So, uh, hopefully that answers the question. The worshiping is fine on any day, but we are not to say that the Sabbath is not important because you know the Sabbath. Uh, what what? Here's how we know the Sabbath is not just something arbitrary, not just something that Yahuwah just was like, okay, you know what? I want you to keep this just because, just because uh, I. I've decided it. However, if you break the Sabbath, I'm going to have you die. Uh, because, you know, it's like other people say the Sabbath, the Sabbath was given so that we could have rest. That's really not, according to the scriptures, what the reason it was given for. Because if it was, 
it'd kind of be like saying to your wife, it'd be like saying to your wife, you know, I'm just going to, I'm going to give you a day off. Don't do any work, okay? I'm just want you to rest and have a, enjoy yourself, relax. But if you don't, I'm going to beat you up. I'm going to, uh, you know, I'm going to punch you and, and make sure you regret it and that you'll never do that again. It's like it doesn't make sense. Why impose a harsh punishment for not resting, relaxing? So when the Sabbath, when we see in the Old Testament that the punishment for breaking the Sabbath was death, that shows us that it's not just a relaxing that the reason it was given, but it was because it's something in its very essence, it's holy. We need to respect this holy thing. Uh, some Jews, I don't believe this, but just to kind of explain the, how we are to kind of approach the Sabbath, is that some uh, Ethiopian Jews, who are not, you know, they're not Christians, they're just Jews, the, the Ethiopian Jews actually believe that the Sabbath is a living being. It's like an angel. They believe the Sabbath is an angel. Uh, and they they like uh, respect her try to honor her uh, they, they try to you know uh, love her and it's kind of, as I said I don't believe the Sabbath is a being a living being but just to kind of show the thought process we should kind of be approaching of this is a holy thing in its very essence we got to respect it and it's not just something arbitrary that you can just snap on the finger and say okay we don't have to do Sabbath anymore uh, be because the law was abolished it's something tied to nature itself the very essence of nature appeals to this fact that on the six days he worked he, he did his work but on the seventh day he did not do work he set it apart and because of that that entire time period is now holy and sanctified in its very being so that it's not just an arbitrary thing that you who have said, okay, don't do work on this day because I said so. It is, this is a holy day, and that's why you who is telling us don't do work because it, that, that is what it is. You can't change what it is. It's like you who are saying, okay, I declare that you no longer are uh, humans. You're no longer humans anymore. Well, if we're still humans, him declaring that we're not humans anymore doesn't change the fact that we are humans. So when when you have someone telling you that the Sabbath was done away because the New Testament tells us, okay, that's no more, we don't have to do it anymore, which it doesn't say that anywhere, but, uh, you know, along that process, if any writing or any writer was to say, okay, the Sabbath is now no more to be done, that doesn't change the fact that the Sabbath is still required because the Sabbath is... It's, it's there. Uh, so that's kind of uh, my answer to that question. Hopefully that uh, explains it well. Now, here's a question by Jason. And he asks, Are there any Gnostic influences to be found at all in the religion of the scrolls? And so, the, the definition of Gnostic needs to first be addressed because uh, Gnostic has multiple meanings. Gnostic in its just in its bare meaning means knowledge and uh, learning. And uh, one of the tenets of Gnosticism is salvation by knowledge. Well, according to the you know the scriptures, we see uh, we must have the knowledge of Yahuwah for salvation. We you know there, there's things like that where so we see that knowledge is in the scrolls. And salvation by knowledge is is in the scrolls as well. Uh, but the when people say Gnostic, in in the negative sense, what they're really referring to is a group of Jews and Christians who had very off beliefs uh, from the norm, and these beliefs were primarily they were summed up as follows: uh, the flesh is evil, so the physical world is evil, the creator is evil, uh, or sometimes they didn't always say the creator is evil, but they would say the creator is dumb or ignorant or stupid, you know, all these different things which are incredibly blasphemous, uh, 
but uh, that's what the Gnostics were teaching that uh, the the creation is evil or maybe not evil all, for some, but they would say it's a mistake, a uh, not good. But Genesis says creation was good, you know. So uh, there's a conflict there with the Gnosticism, and they they twist everything. The law is deemed as evil. The Old Testament has a whole like horrible stuff. They think uh, that's kind of so the New Testament, uh, the, the Christians who teach the law is abolished, they kind of have some Gnostic influence in their teachings. And uh, so, and the Gnostics also taught, like for instance, uh, flesh is bad. Flesh is bad and evil. So don't eat animals because flesh is bad. Don't do that. Uh, and they also, would, some of them would teach, don't. Uh, have sex because the flesh is bad. Avoid it. That, that's evil. That's what some Gnostics taught, but the other Gnostics would teach that the flesh is evil, so we might as well abuse it to, like, spite it. Let's spite that flesh. Of course, that's just a justification of them doing sins that, that, that they want to do, but in their mind, they were convincing themselves, we hate the flesh, but we're going to hate it. We're going to spite our flesh by uh, pleasing it we're giving it all the pleasures it can have just to, you know, to spite it. And so they would indulge in all kinds of pleasures. They would fornicate. They would do all kinds of heinous sexual sins that you can't even talk about uh, with children or even adults. It's just heinous to talk about it with adults because it's disgusting stuff they're doing. Same thing with food that they're eating. Disgusting stuff. What they're eating. You don't want to know what they eat. Uh, there was stuff like that. That, that was going on in these Gnostic groups. So there were some Gnostics who were like super, like, don't uh, do not do anything pleasing to the flesh because that flesh is bad. And then there was others who were saying, the flesh is bad, let's indulge in it and mock it. Uh, and this just comes from demonic stuff and Satan, uh, satanic type of theology. Uh, but the, so the Dead Sea Scrolls does not have any of that kind of stuff. It doesn't have... Uh, sex is evil. It doesn't have eating uh, meat is evil. You know all these different things, um, and it does not have the creator is evil. It doesn't have any of the traditional Gnostic teachings uh, that sh that sh uh, clearly separate Gnosticism from the Essenes. Now there are Gnostic beliefs which uh, the Essenes also had. But these beliefs are not Gnostic. In other words, you can have a belief, but it doesn't mean that that belief is solely belonging to that group. So uh, Gnostics, for instance, believe that a god exists. But just because I believe a god exists doesn't make me a Gnostic. Okay, so some of the beliefs that the Gnostics had, Essenes also had. And Pharisees also had. And other groups also had. Like, so... You can't uh, say that just because some Gnostics taught it that, uh, that it's evil, necessarily. But you have to look and see what are the horrible teachings that the Gnostics teach. And you have to figure out that for yourself. But it's pretty clear the, the main essence of Gnosticism that, that we should regard as evil is creation is evil, the flesh is bad, the creator is bad. Uh, so condemn that stuff. The Old Testament is corrupt and to a point where... The laws are evil, uh, and the entire Old Testament is full of uh, evil stuff from Satan and from other, you know, so things like that, where that's kind of what Gnosticism is, but you don't see that in the scrolls. So to answer that question, I don't really see any Gnostic influences in the scrolls, and it seems to me that the Gnostic, the, the main Gnosticism originated after the Messiah came from the Christians primarily. There was some Gnostic stuff, but for the most part, the Gnosticism kind of uh, went extremely, like, increased when Christianity came because it was spread to the Greeks, to the pagans. And the pagans had already had some of their own Gnostic ideas. Uh, so combining the pagans coming in with heretic Gnostic teachers, like Simon Magus was the biggest one. Uh, he was the worst of them all. The father of heresies the church fathers believed and uh he was the fa essentially the father of christian gnosticism uh simon magus and but there were many teachers in that in the early centuries like valentinus 
uh, and, and others in that early time who the even the Christians, the early Christians who rejected the law, they also condemned the Gnostics because the Gnostics were just way too far off. But these Christians who rejected the law, they also were corrupted by Gnostic influences, unfortunately. One of the biggest examples of this is Augustine, uh, you know, the church father Augustine. He was so corrupted. He, he was a Gnostic, and he converted to Christianity. However, he brought with him his memories and his former beliefs, and some of those beliefs stuck with him, and he uh, shared that with... Uh, he would teach that, and he, he, he wrote so many writings, and Augustine is one of the most uh, looked-up-to writers of the church, and so many people have read his writings. So, you know, that's very dangerous to have someone like that uh, being a, the, one of the biggest influences on so many people in the world. But so that's kind of how uh, Gnosticism originated and how Christianity became – there's a lot of stuff in Christianity that is really similar to Gnosticism, like the belief of original sin, that our flesh is by its nature sinful, and that uh, – and the other one would be that – Whenever you have sex, you pass on the sin nature. The man passes on sin nature by his seed uh, to, uh, to the child that's produced. That's how it's gone through sex. Uh, the sin nature goes through that. That's just right from Gnosticism. But so you see the church really has that uh, Gnostic influence. And, of course, uh, the Jews have their Kabbalah and stuff like that. There, there's things like that where uh, there is some Gnostic stuff for Jews as well, but anyway, so so yeah, I, I think that the Dead Sea Scrolls don't really have any of that Gnostic stuff that we really have to be worried about. Um, now, so the question was asked, what about, uh, this is by Luke, he asks, what about the two messiahs that are spoken about in the Dead Sea Scrolls? Do you believe that Jesus will be Messiah Ben David? Or is there another person who will fulfill this? So, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, as Luke said, to discuss two messiahs. So the, the, the question is, are these two different individuals, or are they sa the same individual? And, and to my understanding, they're the same individual. And here's how I conclude that. The Dead Sea Scroll writers, they had a book in the scrolls called the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs. And in the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs, we see this two Messiah thing all throughout it. However, it unites it as one Messiah. And what it says is the Messiah, uh, or, you know, I don't know, remember if it says Messiah, but it, it talks about someone who's going to come, uh, a king and a priest. A king and a priest is going to come from the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Levi. And he's going to be the salvation, the atonement, uh, and it's clear that when you read the Testaments, it's talking about Yeshua. There's no way around it. It's just too strikingly similar uh, for the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs. These were Testaments, the last words, written by Jacob's twelve sons. Jacob, you know, he had his twelve sons, the sons of Israel. And all of them wrote final words on their deathbeds. Uh, and many of them were prophetic. They prophesied of future things and... and they taught their children righteousness and, and theology and stuff. So uh, in their writings, they teach the, the two messiah thing, but they unite the two messiahs into the single individual. And it seems that the Dead Sea Scrolls can be understood in that way as well. It talks about a teacher of righteousness, and then it says the messiah of, of Aaron and the messiah of Israel. What that means is the messiah from Levi, Aaron, and then the Messiah from Judah, Israel, the, the, the kingdom of Israel. Uh, the, so, uh, and then we have the New Testament, which, of course, you know, says the second coming. And uh, since, as I mentioned before, the New Testament shares so many similarities with the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, we can kind of see what do the New Testament, what does the New Testament say, and then... Uh, we take that and compare it to the Dead Sea Scrolls, so it seems that the New Testament writers understood the two Messiah teaching as being the, the 
the first Messiah will be the priest. He came as a priest. And uh, the second time he comes, he will come as king and reign as king uh, in, for the millennial reign. And uh, sometimes some of the Pharisees have this two Messiah teaching as well. Um, but overall, the, this two Messiah teaching is not so much important to the, it seems to me, uh, to the Pharisees. In fact, a lot of Pharisees like to say that there's many messiahs, uh, that, you know, anyone can be a messiah. So there's nothing really that special about the messiah. Uh, but according to the scrolls and according to the New Testament and Apocrypha writings, uh, what we're told is that the messiah, there are many messiahs, but there is also a special uh, divine messiah who is to come and he is to uh, provide salvation and atonement in a way that no other individual could. And he would be a special, have a special relationship uh, with Yahuwah, the Father. Uh, so that there's a clear difference between the Messiah understanding in Pharisee and the Messiah understanding in Essene and New Testament stuff. Because like in the Dead Sea Scrolls for uh, the Book of Enoch. So we read in the Book of Enoch about the Messiah, uh, the elect one, the son of man. And when you read through that, it gives prophecies of what the Messiah's role is. And his role is described in very great detail of a essentially a, a higher being than just a, nor, a normal human. It's not just a, any ordinary prophet, but it's someone who's very special and uh, and that, that, that's, so that's a uh, clear difference between the Pharisee and the Essene concept. You see in the Dead Sea Scrolls the concept of a divine messiah. Like, for instance, in the Melchizedek document. In that document, it actually says that Melchizedek would come, atone for the people. He would be the messiah and that he is uh, Elohim. So right there, that's calling Melchizedek as messiah and Elohim. And... Uh, there's some other writings as well that suggest uh, that the in, a, in the Dead Sea Scrolls that, that talk about when the Messiah comes, he's going to do things like raise the dead, heal, heal lepers, and he will be called Son of the Most High, and uh, all these different things which uh, correspond so well with the New Testament. And so I'm hoping that answered that question. Uh, so I, I do believe that the Messiah will... Uh, that that uh, Yeshua, when he came, uh, that he came as the, the 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 Messiah of Levi or Messiah of Aaron, and when he comes back, he's going to be the Messiah of Israel or the Messiah of Judah, and essentially both of those personages are going to be united in his single his single identity. That's kind of how I uh, take it. Just like Melchizedek was a priest and king. So also, this single individual, the Messiah, as Hebrew says, Yeshua was made like Melchizedek. So Melchizedek was priest and king. Yeshua will also be priest and king. And the Dead Sea Scrolls tell us there's going to be the priest Messiah and the king Messiah. And Testaments of the Patriarchs tell us one individual is going to be priest and king uh, as Messiah. So hopefully that answers that question. Uh, the next one is by Barbara and she says were the Ten Commandments in the Dead Sea Scrolls and how are they different than what we know today and what is found in our Bibles today so the Ten Commandments uh, in the Dead Sea Scrolls they are very similar however there are uh, some differences and one of the big differences is that uh, uh, there is an extra phrase, for instance, uh, that you find. So the Ten Commandments are in Exodus. They're also in Deuteronomy. Okay. When you compare the two lists, though, there's differences. Deuteronomy has some extra words that are not in Exodus's account of the Ten Commandments. Well, when you look at the Dead Sea Scrolls, Exodus's account of the Ten Commandments agrees with Deuteronomy's. It has that extra words, and um, so that's the main difference, like words here and there, but otherwise the Ten Commandments are essentially the same. Um, 
I'd have to double check in the future, you know, go word by word, letter by letter to see the exact differences, but otherwise, from what can be told, they're the same. I will say this one thing, uh, that the Samaritan Torah, the Samaritan Torah in their Ten Commandments, they have a extra uh, specification for after the Ten Commandments, it says, and you are to build a altar on Mount Gerizim. Uh, if I understand correctly, that is not in the Dead Sea Scrolls. But I'm not entirely 100% certain because the scholars reconstruct it sometimes iffy. Okay, but how they reconstructed it based on their reconstruction, those extra words of the Samaritans are not in the Ten Commandments uh, in the scrolls. There is something else to note. The Septuagint has some of the Ten Commandments in a different order. Uh, I don't remember if the Dead Sea Scrolls has it in that different order or not. I'd have to double check that. But that's something to keep in mind. What is the uh, what is the correct order? Um, because that could be important. Because I've seen doctrines taught on I've myself have taught a doctrine on the correct order of the Ten Commandments. I thought, for instance, that uh, the commandments were listed from from most evil to least evil, going in that row. But the Septuagint, uh, if their order is correct, that refutes that idea. Uh, because in the current order of the Ten Commandments that most people are familiar with, murder would be more evil than adultery. But in the Septuagint, uh, ad adultery comes first. So obviously adultery is not worse than murder. Uh, so uh, so there's things like that where there's some differences which are significant in that sense, like in the Septuagint and other copies. But for the most part, what you, what the main concern is are the Ten Commandments, and those are, you know, to to worship only Yahuwah and uh, don't do idols and uh, don't take his name or his character, his essence in vain. Honor his Sabbath. Um, honor your parents, don't murder, don't do adultery, and you know, the, the other three. The, so those uh, laws, every version that survives it has those same laws, the, same, the message is the same, so that the important thing is in all versions. The important thing of the Ten Commandments is in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and so we know that the Ten Commandments have to be obeyed the law tells us the Ten Commandments. It's, it's reliable, trustworthy. Uh, so hopefully that also answers that question. Um, and then now here's a question asked by Jason. And that is, what was John the Baptist's relationship to the Essenes in your opinion? Well, uh, let me just say this. It's just kind of funny that People are much more likely to believe that John the Baptist was in a scene than that Yeshua was in a scene. But the problem is, there's almost nothing we have about John the Baptist, what he believed or what he taught. Very little stuff. Whereas we have so much more evidence for Yeshua connecting him to the Essenes. But people are so much more, I'm not sure if he's in a scene. But then they jump the gun and say, oh yeah, John the Baptist was in a scene. Even though there's like so much less evidence, uh, it's kind of funny. But uh, basically, it seems to me that... John the Baptist was in his scene. He was was raised uh, by them, uh, and then he, because okay, the Dead Sea Scroll writers tell us uh, they viewed their community in the desert as preparing the way for Yahuwah or the Lord or whatever, uh, and so that same passage was applied to John the Baptist. He applied it to himself. Where did he get this peculiar idea of preparing the way for the Messiah in the wilderness, just like the Essenes were doing? It seems to me that they were having a place to prepare the way, and that's how John the Baptist got there, and he believed in the mission of the Essenes, and so he's decided, I'm going to do what the Essenes told me to do. I'm going to prepare the way for Yahuwah, and so he decided to, to, to do that. That was their mission. The entire Essene community was trying to do that, and he was the John the Baptist was the ultimate fulfillment of that purpose uh, of preparing the way. And 
uh, his way of life, he harshly contradicts the Pharisees. He opposes them, he harshly insults them, and uh, his lifestyle is much closer to an Essene. However, there is a writing, uh, uh, Jose no, 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 um, Slavonic Josephus. Uh, in Slavonic Josephus, we see that John the Baptist was uh, rebuked in a scene. And I take that at face value. It's possible that's not a correct passage, but I believe it probably is. And here's the thing. Not all the Essenes were righteous. We, we can't be naive and think that. We can't think, you know, all, all people of a certain group are a certain way. There are going to be rebels. There are going to be people who take it too far, who, you know. Uh, so John the Baptist was a reformer of the Essene movement. He was teaching, preparing the way for the Messiah to come. And anyone who was not going to accept his teachings, he was going to rebuke and condemn, whether it be the Pharisees or some of his Essene brothers. He was going to con condemn them. So it seems to me John the Baptist started a new movement, a kind of a break off from the Essenes, but he still considered himself an Essene, uh, but he was breaking off from them as saying, I need to teach things that they're not teaching right now. And this is my mission. I'm the prophet. I'm a, I'm a prophet and I'm telling that things need to change and he's coming. Uh, uh, whoever's not on board with that, you know, I separate from you. And, uh, and the Essenes were kind of more like secluded. Whereas John the Baptist was going out, going out to the people uh, more. So he was doing more evangelism type of thing than the Essenes kind of were. The, the Essenes did some evangelism, but nothing like John the Baptist. So he was, I think he was taking some issues with the Essenes as well in that they were, uh, he found that they weren't doing it as well as what he thought needed to be done to prepare for the Messiah. And uh, I guess I would say that was uh, how I view it, because I think the Yeshua also, when he came, he reformed his scenes. So he, he introduced some new laws. Uh, as the teacher of righteousness, he, would, he added some new ideas and concepts. So hopefully that answers that question. So I've gone through all these questions so far. Do you guys have some more questions? Uh, if you do, please uh, write them down. My usual intent for these studies is to do at least an hour and a half uh, but for those who can't stay that long or you know uh, we could always do it shorter uh, and but I, I'm willing to keep going the for the time I was hoping to do uh, but for so if you guys have more questions please share if you don't then I'm gonna just start uh, I'm going to just share some things uh, that are just come to my mind because I want these studies to be not scripted. I don't want them to be scripted. So, uh, because that way we have interaction and we have something real from my heart. It's not just me reading words. And it's all, I'm, I'm not crafting it carefully so that you, you know, like have a perfect argument for you guys. This is just me telling you uh, from what I know. Uh, I find that's more real, more authentic for people. And it would be more interesting because you can cover so many different topics uh, just by not having a script. Uh, so here's the question um, by Jackson. He says, have you read The First Messiah by Weiss? I have not. Uh, let me just answer this uh, a little bit clearer, though, is that I do think it's important to read this, what the scholars have to say. But from my own journey of studying and seeking the truth, I found much more depth in studying the scriptures themselves than studying what others say about the scriptures because you can debate all along with uh, other people about how to interpret the scripture, but unless you read the scripture for yourself, then you know you're just depend you're just relying on someone else's words and ideas. So for me, there's so many extra writings which I consider scripture divinely inspired, and so for me. I find I can gain much more wisdom, much more knowledge of the truth by reading the what the scriptures say. And then I find that most of the, what the scholars have to say, the vast majority of it to me, 
I don't find valuable. I don't find a good use of my time to go through. Uh, but I don't think it's entirely worthless to go through these things for those who uh, feel led to do that. Uh, but you need to be careful and realize that these are just men. They have their ideas. And uh, like with any man, you should be fair and take into consideration what they're saying. But remember, they have bias usually, and they have an agenda usually. And agendas are not always necessarily bad if it's in a good agenda. When you look at the diction, look up the dictionary definition of agenda. It has a it has a negative connotation, but when you look at the good definition, it just basically says you know a a goal or intention. Uh, you know, it's like if you have your agenda of truth seeking, then that's a good agenda. So, but everyone essentially has their own agenda, and you want to know what is their agenda. If their agenda is to undermine the scriptures or to reject the authority of the scriptures, then if you if you accept the scriptures as authoritative, then you want to be wary of that. Uh, so the, the, the thing is with a lot of these writings, like if you ask me, just to kind of uh, save in advance, like if, uh, if other people were to ask me, have you read this book by so-and-so person or this book by so-and-so person, Almost always, I'd probably say I have not read that book uh, because, as I said, I just uh, I don't have a high view of scholars. Perhaps I'm a little bit too harsh with them or too negative uh, in my judgment on the scholars and their value. Uh, but for me, I don't find them a good use of my time. What I do find a good use of my time is if someone comes to me with a question and they're deeply struggling with something and they're a friend of mine or just someone who really needs help and they say I'm reading something in this book and he's making a strong argument I can't refute it I'm having a hard time with this my faith is struggling then you know what then I'm gonna start I'm, I might read that book for my friend uh, to help him but otherwise I'm not gonna read uh, certain things that for me I don't need because I already have uh, books that I find much more important and much more valuable use of my time because there's so many books out there and there's so little time to uh, read so I try to make the most of my time by studying scripture and uh, the ancient writings themselves rather than what people's interpretations are because I for myself I've gone through so many I've seen so many instances of people lying deceiving twisting the truth or not always lying but you know misinterpreting and just being dumb uh, I don't want to trust my what I believe to anyone anymore I'm going to trust people's sincerity, but I'm not going to trust the truthfulness of their statements. I'm going to question it. I'm going to search it myself. And that's why I don't really trust uh, scholars on almost any field unless I know for certain that what they're saying is true. Like, so for science, uh, I'm using a computer right now. So I don't, I don't, I'm not dumb and, and I don't say, Oh, uh, you know, the science behind computers, that has to be false, you know, because that doesn't make sense. I'm using a computer, so it has to be true. They know what they're doing by making a computer. Okay, so uh, I, it's, it's things like that where what I know to be true from the scholars, yeah, I'm going to accept that. I, I don't need to re uh, question that. But if it's like uh, medical science, I question it. If it's... Uh, evolution, if it's any type of thing on any subject, I'm going to question it uh, because, you know, their interpretations are just so easily corrupted. So I don't trust what other people say uh, being accurate. I only trust myself. And that's why uh, I rather just read the writings myself than read someone else's interpretation. And then I try to figure out the interpretation from reading the writings. And then that, that really is sufficient for me, but for other people, they have a hard time thinking about things, so they need someone else to help guide them. And for those people, then uh, you got to be careful what you read, because if you just believe whatever you read, then you've got a problem, because there's so much false teaching out there. So, uh, so uh, um, I don't understand... Uh, the question that Mike is asking. Um,
Okay, I'm waiting for everyone. I'm waiting for the question to come in. So I'll just hold on one moment. Okay, so the question is essentially uh, question asked by Mike. Uh, how can you essentially how can you ignore the scholars that are uh, a, that are uh, considered uh, highly acclaimed by the scholar scholarly community? And some examples would be. Uh, Eliar and Collins and Larson, of course, those are the last names uh, of these scholars. And uh, the basic thing is uh, most of these scholars start with, uh, start with a faulty assumption. And when you start with a faulty assumption and then work your thesis from that false assumption, then everything is everything you're building is based on a lie is based on a falsehood so what you do is you familiarize yourself with what they're teaching what they believe if you see that there's a, a lie that's part of their foundational thesis where everything else builds off of it then you know if, if if you can prove to yourself if you know for a fact that that foundational thing is a lie everything else like take take that piece away just take it away. Say, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that piece away. Take it away. Everything all of a sudden just falls and is gone. It, it demolishes, falls on top of itself, crushes, and the entire thing uh, cannot support itself. The foundation piece you just removed. Uh, that's the basic idea. So uh, you have to look at the, uh, familiarize yourself with what the scholars are teaching. Uh, if you accept, here's the thing. What? It's based on what uh, you you have seen of the of the evidence. So, for those who accept uh, the scriptures, for instance, as prophetic, divinely inspired, things like that, if you are convinced, you have to prove it to yourself. If you're if you've proven something is scripture, then uh, then if you're seeing that their foundational argument is based on the idea that prophecy is false. Then you know that okay, well, their 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 entire argument is on the idea that prophecy is impossible. But if we believe prophecy is possible, then their entire argument is uh, demolished. Then what you have is uh, you have um, speculation. Okay, so there's speculation, and then there's how can I not trust these scholars? Well, here's the thing. You got one scholar saying one thing, you got another scholar saying another thing that contradicts this guy, you got this scholar saying that, this scholar, you know, all these scholars saying one thing and contradicting the other. And they all they all think that they're right. They're all considered uh, legitimate scholars, uh, but they, they have major differences often from what they're saying. So the thing is what we're seeing is it's a little different the uh, the the scholar uh, what the scholars are saying is something different when you see what scientists are doing because what scientists are doing they they uh what they're looking at is they're, they're trying to do tests you know and uh um so if you have something that's very easy to show like uh you know like if you do a test saying all right let's see uh let's see if uh like trying to test, you know, gravity, or you know, I know some people in the Hebrew roots movement don't believe in gravity. So, basically, whatever is causing the objects to fall to the ground, you can test that through a mechanical observation experiments. And you can see, oh yeah, it's, it's falling down at a certain rate. So all the scientists are looking and they're seeing. All you have to do is observe it. Everyone's observing the same thing, you know. So it's like. So science, there's a very clear process which uh, doesn't have, you don't have people like uh, 
contradicting each other so horribly in every issue. There are some science issues where you do have people like that, but here's why. Because their science is not based on proof, but it's based on assumptions. That's when you start getting into issues of iffiness. Uh, but when you have something clear and that's absolutely observable, then there's not really room for debate. But when there is room for debate, when there's differences of opinion in mainstream, then it shows that it's just kind of speculation. Like, for an example, people are arguing or debating about who was the teacher of righteousness? Who was the teacher of righteousness? The scholars think, like, they, they, they put forth their theories, but you see it, there's so much speculation, and there's no way to prove what these guys are saying. So, and you'll see that this is, this happens with almost all the scholar claims, what they're doing, there's a lot of speculation going on. Uh, if you, like, let's say you look at Elior's, uh, some of Elior's stuff, uh, I've heard of some of her teachings, some of her stuff is true, but some of it is just complete speculation. And there's no way for her to prove her claims. We might be inclined to think that's true. We might think that's a good idea. That might that probably explains what might have happened. But you can't say that definitely is what happened because there are other possibilities of what happened. And if we say that something has to be true because a scholar said it, then... Uh, we're closing our mind to other possibilities, and we and I don't want to do that. So, so there's all these things of scholars contradict each other, so they're unreliable in that sense. Scholars horribly speculate, unreliable in that sense, and they have major false concepts that they're relying on as their main argument for everything else that that builds off of it. Uh, so. Most of these scholars are not really believers, or if they are, they don't believe in the same way uh, that someone who believes in the, uh, like, so for instance, uh, the, the Book of Enoch. You know, for the, for the Essenes, I can tell you the Essenes did not believe that Enoch was written uh, in the 3rd century or the 4th century B.C. They believed Enoch was written by the prophet uh, Enoch, uh, and we see in... Uh, the Book of Jubilee says the same thing. Jubilee says Enoch was the Enoch wrote a book, uh, and um, there's so many other books out there, so many apocryphal books. And uh, Jude in the New Testament says Enoch wrote uh, uh, this book, or he he did this prophecy. And um, so, to the ancient writers, what did they believe? That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to go to what the ancient faith was, the Essenes. I try to follow what the Essenes believed in their life, uh, in religion. I'm open to other arguments. I'm open to evidence. Uh, but I'm going to approach it from my faith. And my faith is the Essene faith. So in order for me to accept these scholarly beliefs, I have to deny my Essene faith by saying, you're right, these writings are, are not really uh, valid. Uh, they were forged or, you know, uh, written in the name of a prophet, and they really really weren't written by that prophet, that kind of goes against what the Essenes believed. And so, for someone who's convinced that Enoch, it was written by Enoch, for, such as myself, and for many of you out there uh, who are listening, if you're convinced Enoch is by Enoch, Elior, Collins, all these scholars that you listed, I'm pretty sure they all don't believe that Enoch was written by Enoch. They date Enoch to the uh, to the fourth or third or sometimes second century BC, uh, and they say that the there's five sections of Enoch, and they say there was five different authors. Someone wrote the first part of the Book of Enoch, and then some other guy wrote the second part, and some other guy wrote the third, and some other guy wrote the fourth, and some other guy wrote the fifth, and then they put it all together and claimed that that was all written by Enoch. Uh, it seems to me that the Essenes had no no understanding of this at all, and for those who accept the Book of Enoch as divinely inspired uh, and as written by Enoch, we you know we can't we can't accept what the scholars are saying because it goes completely against what the essence of our faith is. Of we believe that these are true writings. Uh, and okay, so he, so here's a specific argument. Uh, for example, uh, there it says, 
so one one way to date the Book of Enoch, for instance, is a reference to uh, to Parthia in the Book of Enoch. Uh, now, what I'm told, I don't know this is true, but I'm just going to trust and assume the information is correct, uh, is that Parthia came into uh, existence at uh, 250 BC. That's what I'm being told. I don't know if that's true, but we're just going to assume that's true. And so, so let me explain how you know the approach would be to something like this. There's two ways to approach it. First of all, again, there's the there's the prophecy argument, uh, but then there's the scripture was altered argument. So uh, I'm going to show you an example of something. Let, let me get my book here. Okay, it's it's it shows that you can't assume that that was the original reading of the Book of Enoch. So let me show you an example. This is from the Book of Daniel. Um, this is from the Book of Daniel. I'm pretty sure this. I remember reading this. Um, I just have to find it here. It's in the prophecies of of the nations um, or not of the kingdoms. Uh, let's see here. Uh, let's see if I can find it. Um, hmm. It might take me a little while to find it, so I'm not sure if I should look right now to, to uh, take your time. But basically, I'm I'm pretty sure I remember uh, in the book of Daniel, there are some manuscripts which say, uh, like in, in the Hebrew text, it says something like, it doesn't tell us what the nation is. Like, it, it makes it symbolic. But then in the Septuagint, it says... These are the so-and-so nation, or something like that. Uh, there's, there's things like that. So it's like, in other words, uh, yeah, there, there's things like interpolations, uh, which is things added into the scripture as uh, to clarify a passage, to interpret, to give commentary, things like that. So when I say the book of Enoch was written by Enoch, I don't mean to say that every word in there is authentic. Uh, you have to do textual criticism, and there's differences in manuscripts. But so many of these arguments are like that, where it uh, they find certain things like that, and then they say, okay, well, this can't be true because it's a it's describing Parthia, uh, so it must have been written after Parthia came into existence. Uh, but that can just that is so easily uh, dismissible by the very idea of, okay, well, they very well may have uh, uh, a scribe may have uh, wrote it in. Uh, to, to show you an example of, uh, okay, the, the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs. That, when you compare to the original version that's found in fragments in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs was really altered from the original version. So if you look at the Greek version and you're seeing there's things like this. It says uh, like it says like Cappadocia. Uh, Cappadocia as one of the names. Uh, and that's like a later thing too. Um, but the problem is the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs are reworked versions of the original text. And the original text was much longer, and it worded things differently. Uh, so you can't use the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs to say that this must have been written way later. Uh, it, this mu this could not be written by the Patriarchs because it describes things like it uh, it uses language that came later because scribes came later and they were copying later. Right, but uh, the but the books that they were copying are there's evidence very often there's evidence that these books come from an older time period, and so that you can have a book in its purity, and then you can have a book in its alteration, where you can't judge the the alter the altered version as if it was the original version. That's a mistake. Uh, just to give an example, uh, Homer. 
we do you uh, hopefully you guys know about Homer he was one of the most famous of the Greeks and his writings were kind of almost treated as the Greek Bible and that was he wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey well something very similar happened with his writings that has happened with the Bible in the scriptures he wrote his originals and his originals are very different in many places than the, ma the vast majority of copies later on that are that are available to people so if you make an argument that Homer didn't write this by appealing to this later edited version that's not really about these scholars who say Homer didn't write this stuff it was probably by someone else and yet the version of Homer that they're judging their ideas on is the altered edited version and the oldest manuscripts of Homer are fragments, and those fragments show huge major differences, uh, which suggests that uh, some of these arguments by scholars are based on a lie. And that lie is that these later versions are the original, but when they're not. So when you say the book of, so for instance, when you use the book of Enoch, see certain things in there and say, okay, well, some of these lines, some of these words, this cannot be. Uh, by Enoch so this means the entire books not by Enoch that's a fallacy because uh, the as I said there's there's so much evidence in pretty much all writings that exist of major changes being done uh, the original writings uh, were often very different than the later finalized version you'll see that in the Bible and so many other writings it happened let me tell you for the Bible what it happened you can compare uh, Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Those are major changes in the different versions, uh, some huge differences. There's 1st uh, uh, and 2nd Samuel and 1st and 2nd Kings, some major, major differences in the different versions that exist. Uh, there are huge differences in Proverbs and in the book of Psalms and uh, the book of Esther, huge differences in Esther. Um, and book of Daniel as well there's, there's just so many things in these in the other ones that I didn't mention too but uh, so I would say you the scholars that date these things make assumptions which they never proved and that's why I stay away from the scholars because they're constantly making these kind of assumptions constantly speculating and then they base they base new arguments on their unproven speculations. So they say, okay, well, since this has to be true, which maybe it doesn't, but they say it has to be, and they say, okay, then this has to be true, or then this has to be true. Right? And, and so many of these things are not really uh, proven. So um, uh, and so right now we are uh, about not quite but about an hour and 20 minutes into it I wanted to do this for at least an hour and 30 minutes but for those uh, who can't uh, basically when I get to that time I'm gonna ask you all you know how are you doing do you want to stay longer who wants to continue and and depending on what people say then we'll see where we'll end and for those who cannot stay for the whole thing you can end whenever you feel needed to and the rest of this is going to be on recording so if you have to leave before we uh, end it, the rest you can listen to on a recording if you want to. So this question was asked, uh, well, let, let me just say, hopefully Jackson that answered the question. Uh, I'm not saying that scholars should just be ignored and that you sh I'm not saying to be closed minded either. Closed minded, I'm not saying that. Uh, so uh, you should take into consideration what the scholars are saying and if they make a good argument, then you should really deal with it. Like, and we, what's our goal? Our goal is we want to prove to the world that the, what the truth is. If the scriptures are true, then we got to convince people they're true. So we got to look and see what are the arguments people are using against these books. So yeah, there is value in, in reading these books uh, for that purpose of if these books are valid, we've got to refute their arguments. And that, that, that is a value to read these writings. And then in the process, if I believe a writing is valid and I want to prove to people that it's false, uh, excuse me, I want to prove to people that it's true uh, and that it's not false, 
and I start reading, but then I start seeing their arguments, and I'm like, you know what? I think they're right, man. They're 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 arguing. I can't I can't I can't uh, go against their arguments. They're just too convincing. Uh, when that happens, you know that that's what the seeker of truth does. You start out with your belief, but you have to be open. And then you're trying to prove to others what you believe is true, but you are open to the arguments. You're considering the evidence. You're seeing and saying, uh, this maybe not. This isn't adding up. I thought it was agreeing with what I believe, but now I'm seeing things that aren't adding up. So maybe I'm wrong. I'm open to that. But what I'll tell you is I'm not uh, an airhead either. So that. I'm not going to just change my mind just because someone is strongly trying to argue with me and show me lots of what they think is good evidence. I'm going to really struggle with it, and and it's possible that perhaps on some issues I might have a hard time changing my mind. Most A lot of people have a hard time changing their mind when they're wrong. Uh, so you have to struggle with it, and you have to go through the process, and hopefully you're open-minded enough and humble enough to admit you're wrong and change your beliefs when they show the evidence that you're wrong. Uh, but as a believer, as in a scene, I, I, I follow the, the, these documents so that I think that in the main, they are legitimate writings and authentic writings, so I stay away from what the scholars are saying for myself. I will study the, what the scholars say in the future to try to help other people. Um, but as a seeker of truth of studying the scriptures, I don't think their interpretation of scripture is valid because they don't understand the scripture's authenticity. Uh, it's vi how someone how someone who interprets scripture who does not believe it's authentic is very very different from someone who believes it's authentic. I think we all can agree on that. There's something to be said about someone who knows okay this is authentic this is scripture this is prophecy. I'm going to interpret it as prophecy. As compared to someone who does not believe it's prophecy, you know, that's going to be a completely different perspective of how to interpret the passage. Uh, so, uh, anyway, hopefully that answers the question of why I'm just very wary of uh, what these scholars have to say. Uh, so David asked this question. Yeah, I said uh, recently... I said that I don't believe the 1,000 year reign or the millennial kingdom, uh, it's not going to begin for uh, another 150 years about. Now what's your question? You're wondering why I believe that? Is that correct? That's your question? Or uh, just making sure that's what you, what you were asking. Uh, I, I think that's what you're asking. So, uh, yeah, okay, so basically, you're going to see in so many different groups of when is the end times, you know, they try to figure out, they try to figure out the exact year, or roughly the exact approximation time of when the Messiah is going to return and usher in the 1,000 year reign. There's a teaching in the ancient writings which says, you know how there's the six days of creation and then there's the Sabbath? Uh, day holy. Uh, well, similarly, there's 1,000 years for each day because a day with Yahuwah is as a thousand years. So, 6,000 years of working against Satan, uh, doing the work against Satan's uh, power, and then on the seventh period, the seventh day, the seventh period of 1,000 years, it's that's that's the 1,000 years that Revelation speaks of. Uh, and what does Revelation say? It says Satan will be uh, chained for the 1,000 years. Okay, so uh, that's just very interesting to see. Okay, so the, for the 6,000 years, the six days, you have to work against the forces of evil. But on the seventh day, it's in a thousand year peace, rest, a Sabbath, millennial Sabbath, and uh, where Satan is locked up. And you don't have to worry about that. You don't have to. Uh, work against his his influence. So it seems that that's a very legitimate uh, understanding, and that's confirmed by ancient scriptures, apocrypha. And so the idea is, okay, if that's true, then that means the Messiah is going to come back to set up the kingdom 
6,000 years from the time of creation approximately. Well, that, we have to figure out when was creation. So using the copies of scripture to figure out when creation was. However, there's a major problem. Most people who are figuring out when the year of creation was are using the Masoretic text, the Hebrew text that everyone loves. Well, not everyone, but most of the Messianic movement loves. The problem is the Masoretic text is corrupted in many ways, horrible ways often. The chronology of when things happened is majorly altered. And we can see, comparing from history, we know it, that some of, the, some of their ideas are contradicting history as well. And so uh, the rabbinic calendar, the rabbinic chronology that comes from the Masoretic text is an error. And so we need to use something more reliable. The Septuagint is also an error. There's just you can see there's just too, uh, too many errors in it. Uh, and so it seems to me that Jubilees, the Book of Jubilees, is the only one that's trustworthy for the chronology. So what does Jubilees tell us? It says that the Exodus happened in uh, 2,410 years from the year of creation. Then. Uh, okay, and also Jubilees tells us that a Jubilee is 49 years, not 50 years. Okay, so it's 49 years, and the 50th year is the year of Jubilee, which is the new year. It's a beginning of another Jubilee. Uh, it's not the end of the former Jubilee, as, as the Pharisees say. So it's not 50 years for a Jubilee, but it's 49, and the 50th is the new year, or the Jubilee year. It introduces, brings in the next thing. Uh, so that's what Jubilees tells us. It's 49 years. And so Jubilees tells us uh, the Exodus uh, happened 2,410 years from creation. When you do the math, that indicates that they entered the Promised Land in the 50th Jubilee. So in other words, in the year of Jubilee of Jubilees, they entered the Promised Land. That's a very significant meaning. Then we see in 1 Kings. 1 Kings tells us that from the Exodus to the first temple being built was 480 years. So 10 years, uh, the 10 years before the Exodus plus the 480, look at that, that's 490 years, which is 10 Jubilees. Then you've got Daniel, Daniel 9. It tells us that there would be from the, from the decree of Cyrus all the way to when the Messiah would be, uh, would die would be about 490 years. It would be uh, the 70 weeks, 77s. Uh, so 490 years, once again. There's the 490 at the beginning, then there's the 490 there. And then when you look in the middle, from the first temple to the decree of Cyrus, the math adds up. It's 490 years in the middle as well. So you've got the beginning uh, 2,401 years, and you've got 490, 490, 490, and that brings you all the way to the 30s, 30s AD. Uh, that's when he died, the Messiah died. And then from that time, you just count to see where we are in our year. And, uh, and then you count to see where the year 6000 is. And according to this count that I just did, the year 6000 is... Uh, in 2160s or 2170s, very far off time. And this contradicts what most people are trying to tell you that is going to happen soon. But what you're going to do is, even if you don't believe me, if you don't believe I'm right, what you're going to find is if you're young, or if you're, you know, depending how old you are, you're going to live for many years, however long you live, and you're going to see. You're going to live to 100 years. You're going to live however long. You're going to see he's not coming back. And I'm going to be right. And you'll remember what I said, hopefully. And you'll, maybe that'll, maybe in your, la your later days, you'll remember what I said. And you might be inspired to look at some of what I said. Because right now you might think I'm a little crazy for teaching this idea. But maybe later on when you see I'm right, you might think, you know, maybe he had something right. And then you'll come back, revisit some of my teachings, perhaps. But so I, I, I'm strongly convinced that you're going to find later on in your life that, that I'm right, that he won't be coming back probably in any of our lifetimes unless we live, you know, it's possible that some of us might be blessed with very long life, 
then we, you know, we might live until he comes back. But otherwise, uh, we'll, live, we'll live to 100, we'll die, he still won't be back. Uh, because there's too many things that have to happen, too many prophecies that have to happen. Uh, uh, in, there's so many extra writings which give extra details of things that have to happen, which I, I believe still has to happen. A lot of people believe that these prophecies have already been fulfilled, uh, but there's so many prophecies that I accept as valid, true prophecy, which if they are true, there's a lot more stuff that has to happen that nothing happened yet. And you, you ain't saying nothing yet. There's, it's going to get much worse than you could possibly imagine. And the timeline is completely off. It, uh, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, has a war scroll. And the war scroll says uh, there's going to be a 40-year war. Well, if that's a literal war that's going to happen, you know, that's what the Essenes believed. It was a literal war that they believed was going to happen. And I believe it's going to happen as well. Uh, if that is going to happen, well, look, it hasn't happened yet. And it's a 40-year war. So uh, that means at least 40 years until the end, until the millennial, uh, which is still a very long time. And that's if they start the war right away, which they're not going to because what does the war scroll tell us? It tells us that uh, it says that Israel is not is not going to fight during the Sabbath years. Well, what do we see right now? The army of Israel is fighting during the Sabbath years. What's the war scroll say about a woman? It says no woman is allowed to be in in the army. Well, what do we see? We see women being forced into Israel's army. So if the war scroll is valid, a lot needs to change for Israel as a nation. Israel needs to really be purified, come back to Torah, and decide, you know what? We need to start following Torah because we're tired of our nation being lawless. Let's go back to the Torah. If they start following the scrolls, that would be amazing. If they start realizing the scrolls are truly inspired, that would be a... a you know, a uh, restoration that would be un amazing. And all, that, all it would have to take is one king, or one, you know, one leader of uh, of the Israel. Because what do we see in the Old Testament? Josiah, Hezekiah, those are two kings which, when they did their reforms, everyone followed along. They followed along in righteousness. Because why? It was made the law. And if it's, it's, if it's made the law, the nation's going to follow most of them, most of them. most of them. Uh, then we see for the evil kings. The evil kings. Uh, what happened when there was an evil king? The vast majority of the population followed along with the evil king, because when an evil king has laws that say you must do evil, then most people are going to do evil because they don't want to get in trouble with the law. And then when there's a law that says you can do evil, then most people are going to do it because that's in most people's desire of if they can get away with it they want to do it if it benefits them and they, if they like that if they if they want it so that's unfortunately that's what most people think like and but so all it takes is one righteous king that's going to come or you know one righteous prime minister whatever uh he can change israel through policies and a a, a coalition of believers in israel and all of a sudden, in a single generation, they can be back to Torah. Uh, so we'll, we'll see when that happens. But in my view, based on the, what we see in the scriptures, so many things have to happen. The blood moons, uh, you know, that's not legit stuff because here's the thing. The scriptures are telling us there are signs. And when you see this, it's going to tell you that something really horrible is happening. But the problem is these red blood moons happen through all history happen all the time that these red blood moons that people are talking about when it says that the moon is going to be red blood i believe it's probably going to be much redder than people think you know it's probably going to be red in a way that freaks people out uh that like that I, that's not normal why is that red like that that's freaky you know something like that and it's going to be something unexpected it's going to be something that you cannot predict because if you can predict if you can predict it how is it really a sign of judgment you know it's something that's going to freak people out. It's going to scare them and think, okay, I got to repent because I'm seeing a red moon up there. What, what in the world is this? You know, it's things like that. When you read Revelation, that's the idea we're seeing is that a lot of these judgments are like 
uh, traumatic things. It's it's it, you know hail's gonna come. It's gonna be huge hailstones. It's gonna be like something like this size of a hailstone. Uh, like I think it said something like seventy pounds or something, according to the literal interpretation anyway. Uh, so there's things like that. Well, if you see a hailstone like this, that's going to be pretty scary. Um, so obviously none of this is happening yet. So for people who are saying the end times are here, every times are here. Well, but the problem is none of the rev what Revelation is saying is is going to happen hasn't really happened in that literal sense yet. So until we start seeing some of this stuff happen, let's take it down a bit and not say, oh, he's coming back right now because. So much has to happen that hasn't happened. So let, let's stop saying he's going to come back in a couple years from now, and then he doesn't come back. Let's stop saying he's going to come back 2030, and he doesn't come back 2030. You know, every time we make a prediction and it fails, we uh, Satan laughs, and the, the people who don't uh, accept our faith, they laugh and find it, you know, that, like, they're like, uh, putting us down saying oh they're so crazy they're so stupid because you know they, we show ourselves how gullible we are how naive we are when we fall for it again and again you know people say oh he's coming now and we fall for it and it doesn't happen and then they say it again and people fall for it again but it keeps happening why are people falling for it every single time and it, you know it's kind of laughable uh, but let's stop doing that instead let's stick with what the scriptures say and, uh, you, you know, let, let's stick with what the scriptures say and let's not, uh, because if we say that judgment is coming when it's not, we're accountable for anyone who leaves the faith because of that. That's on us. Uh, we just cause someone to doubt their faith and to, to fall away. Uh, so you got to be very careful with what you're teaching. Unless you know for sure, for certain, that he's going to come back at a certain time. Try not to say it. Almost view it like a prophecy. You know, false prophets, according to the Torah, the scriptures, false prophets get the death penalty. So if you're going to make a prediction about something, pro prophesying about something, and then you're wrong, it's almost like you deserve death. Maybe not quite because you're not technically prophesying, but it's almost very similar because you're saying this is going to happen, people. You're declaring something as truth, that not that's what Yahuwah is doing. So you got to be careful when you're saying Yahuwah is doing this because if he's not, then look what you just did. You just you have blood on your hands. You you've got you know. So instead of trying to figure out when uh, when the end is and keep failing like that, let's try to focus what the scriptures say, obey it, and uh, when the end is coming, when the end is here, you will know it. It'll be so obvious, like, okay, unless you see the Antichrist, the end's not here, okay? So why don't we wait until we actually see some of this stuff happening? Uh, until we see an Antichrist, until we see huge, like, weather things going on. Like, the Revelation says one-third of the animals in the sea are going to die. One-third of this is going to happen. One-third of this. If that's literal, that hasn't happened yet. Let's wait until that happens. When that happens... Then maybe we have an argument of, okay, he's coming back soon. But until some of this stuff happens, let's stop being ridiculous. Uh, and as I said, based on my studies, the mathematics, if the theory is right, the 6,000-year theory, uh, using the Book of Jubilees, that, that dating system that I provided, it's only going to be like 160 years from now. Uh, so we've got lots of time. People. And you're going to see I'm right, I believe, uh, in your life as it pans out. Uh, that it won't gonna, It's not going to happen in this century. I, I strongly believe that. Uh, and Barbara asks, is the War Scroll available for us to read in English? It is. There's a translation of it. You can find PDFs of it online. Uh, for those who would want to read it, I can show it uh, online after. Uh, but the only thing about this, just want people to know, as I said, the War Scroll... It basically gives commandments of how to build, how to do war. And what we want is people who don't, like, we want the enemy to not take this war scroll seriously. Okay? We don't want them to take it seriously. Because if they, in other words, if you're trying to fight an army, if you're trying to fight an army, people, uh, you don't want the enemy knowing your battle plans, right? 
that doesn't make sense. Why would you want an enemy knowing your, bat your battle plans? So we got to be careful who we're sharing the war scroll with because if we start, if it, if the war scroll is pop is publicized enough, like let's say for instance Israel makes an announcement and says we accept the war scroll as scripture, and you know, think about that for a second. So all their enemies are going to start reading it and seeing, okay, what are they going to try to do to us? Uh, they're going to have the war plan. And they're going to see what they're going to, what Israel is going to try to do. Because if Israel is going to try to follow what the war scroll says, literally, if they're going to try to do it, even if you don't think the war scroll is valid, all it has to take is for an Israelite leader to say, you know what, I think it's valid. Let's do this. And they're going to try to do it. If they try to do it, the enemy can just see what their plan is and say, oh, okay, they're going to try to do this. Well, we know how to stop that. Uh, so my advice to you is, yeah, we can share it. The war scroll but be careful who you're sharing it with because uh, we want it to make sure that it doesn't get in the wrong hands people can abuse it they can abuse it to try to justify murdering people we don't want that to happen um, okay so you just be careful with the writing that it's not intended for everyone to read it's intended for people who believe it's who are inclined to believe it's true and then who for people who who uh, want to protect people's life we know we don't, we don't want to we don't want people starting a war uh, when without legitimate basis. Uh, so someone might read the war scroll and say, you know what? I'm a son of light. I'm going to start killing people now. And they'll start fighting a war. You know, you, it would seem crazy, but I bet there's people out there who might do that because I've met some crazy people in my life. Uh, you know, some really crazy stuff, some really crazy people out there who will do almost anything if you convince them something. Uh, there's some, you know, so you, we want to make sure that things like this, the War Scroll, uh, Book of Revelation, all these things, End Times Prophecies, be careful who you're sharing End Times Prophecies with because they can easily corrupt it and make it into something very negative and detrimental to our faith. So yeah, that's the, the warning I give. But so I can share the War Scroll PDF online. You can, in any copy of the Dead Sea Scrolls of the complete text, you should find the War Scroll in it. Uh, but I, it's, I can send the copies online. So hopefully uh, that, that's sufficient for you. Uh, so we've done this for about an hour and 40 minutes. It seems like uh, we'd probably be ending soon, but are there any last minute questions anyone has? I can try to answer like maybe one or two more questions if anyone does have anything. Uh, I'll wait and see if there's anyone who has a final question or two. Not seeing anything, but I'll just wait a little bit more, seeing if. Uh... And as I'm waiting, just so you guys know, I've done two, I've done two of uh, these studies already. Uh, these question and answer type of studies. If you like this thing that I've been doing, I'm doing this once a week, uh, on Wednesdays at 9 p.m. Eastern time, and so you can find me on Facebook. Onia, uh, O N I E H. So let me type that out for you guys. Onia Carlson. You'll you'll see my name on Facebook. You should easily find me. And uh, I have a Dead Sea Scroll group. I have a Bible Project group. I have different groups out there uh, devoted to my studies and my ministries that I try to do. And so. Um, Please, if you're, if you're interested in this information, I encourage you to come back every, once a week if possible. Uh, it's going to be recorded on YouTube, for, so for you who cannot attend live like this, it'll be on YouTube. And in the future, anyone who's here, uh, I'm considering possibly changing the time from Wednesday to some other time. But right now we're doing Wednesdays at 9. But I want as many to come as possible. So if there's another time in the week where more people can come, then I'll probably change it to that time. So for those who have a better time, that's better for them. Just let me know on Facebook what that time is for you. Um, so there was another question that was asked. And again, one or two more questions. So if you guys, if there's any more questions, just put it here now. But otherwise, this will be the last question. So 
the question was, was there any relationship between the scroll community and the militant zealots in your view? I will say this, that it seems to me that there were different Jewish groups and different Christian groups which came out of the Essene movement and which have some Essene ideas, but they broke away from them. Uh, just like you have the Catholic Church, who came out of it? The Protestants, and then from the Protestants had all their different groups. But they all share very similar ideas from the original, but then there's many differences as well. So it seems to me that you've got the original Jews, the, then you've got the, the Essenes and the Pharisees breaking away. Uh, the main difference is the Essenes accepted so many other books and the Pharisees did not. And they, the Pharisees preferred their oral law instead of the extra books. That's the main difference there that, where they broke off. The Essenes, when they were uh, from the Essenes, broke off of Sadducees, and they mainly focused on the law. They didn't really accept the other books, but they had a lot of the Essene ideas. Okay, so the Sadducees broke off. Then it seems like the Zealots uh, was a joint community of not just Essenes, but like kind of like people from all different parties, uh, all different groups who were united in a cause of of overthrowing uh, the Romans and taking back Israel for themselves. And so modern Israel today has a spiritual successor to these ancient uh, Sikari. Sikari were like dagger Jews who would like stab people and kill them uh, because they weren't circumcised or different things like that. They basically were Jewish terrorists. There are those today in Israel. There's a spiritual successor to a movement like that where they're very militant, they're very hateful, and uh, terroristic-like. And so it seems to me that there were some Essenes who joined that movement because they had, they you know, they shared the belief that the Romans should not be here. We need to put a stop to this. This is our land. We have the right to take action. Uh, in the Maccabees, what happened in the Maccabees? Uh, someone someone sacrificed on the altar to Zeus. Okay, uh, just so you know the Maccabees story. Uh, the Greeks came in, took over, outlawed the Torah, and said, uh, "You have to worship our gods, and if you don't, we're going to kill you. You have to stop keeping the Torah. If you keep the Torah, we're going to kill you." So uh, they. One guy in the book in the book of Maccabees, it says one of the Israelites came up and did a sacrifice on the altar. So the main guy, one of the leaders of the Maccabees, is like, ah! and he he runs over and he kills the guy right there at the altar, kills him. Similar to what Phineas did, Phineas went up to the into the tent when they just did it boldly in front of him. Uh, they went and started doing fornication. He went, no, stabbed. Stabbed them and killed them. So the Jews were kind of thinking they were justified. Like, well, the Maccabees did it. Well, this guy did it. So we have the right to do it because Israel is occupied by the Romans unrighteously. And we have the power, not the Romans. So we're going to be the judges. And if people are not circumcised, well, we're going we're gonna to make sure they get cut off. Cut off. We're going to make sure they are... We're going to punish these people. You know, so... This was a group of people from all different groups who were united on that belief that Israel was theirs and that they could bring the law into their own hands. It's so like, you know how the Torah says, uh, says homosexuals are to be stoned, adulterers are to be stoned, uh, different things like that. Well, as most of us know, that's not for us to do. We don't have a right to do that because we're not judges. We don't have the authority to do that. But these people, the zealots, were like, no, well, we are a priest in a kingdom. We, you know, we are uh, the we are the true people, and we are to impose the law on the land. If we don't, we're breaking the Torah. So they went ahead and started killing people who were breaking Torah. So there were people who were attracted to that from all different groups: the Essenes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. They all liked the law, and they all had people who went a little too crazy and started taking the law into their own hands. So they were united in that purpose. So I wouldn't say it's just the Essenes. I would say it's all the different groups. Uh, 
I don't know who started the movement. I haven't researched that enough, but uh, you know, it it was. Uh, I don't think the Essenes are mil militaristic in the sense most people think, uh, because the War Scroll seems like an eschatological war. It doesn't seem like it was something that they did uh, as part of their lives. They were very holy and righteous people. They they weren't attacking people. They were just separating from them. They hated them and said, "Get away from me! Don't touch me!" You know, uh, I don't want to touch you. You're unclean. But they didn't kill them. They didn't. They didn't try to, you know, do horrible stuff to people. They just believed in major separations. S stay away from me. Uh, you know, it's that type of thing. It, it, the Essenes were not these type of people who would punch people, who would attack people, who are of different faiths, who would murder people for not believing what they did. It was none of that stuff. They didn't. They weren't militaristic like that. Uh, there's no evidence for that. There's just they believed that there was going to be a war in the end times, and but they didn't they didn't uh, put that war into practice. Oh, and so it seems like the zealots may have believed the war scroll perhaps was valid, and they were trying to make the war happen, perhaps you know something like that. Um, who knows? They, there's things like that where uh, they were trying to bring about the end times, and that's not good. Uh, we don't want to do that when that's not intended. So hopefully that answers the question. I just think that it's really unfortunate to take the extremists and then say, okay, that means they're all like that. Or, you know, or to, uh, you just read the Dead Sea Scrolls, you'll see that there's peace in there. You'll see that there's love. And here's something funny. The works of the law are in the Dead Sea Scrolls, right? Uh, so, but you know how Paul says, uh, we're not justified by the works of the law. Some people argue Paul was not talking about the law of Moses, but he was talking about the Essene beliefs. And yet, in the Essene writings, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, we have Psalms, the Thanksgiving Psalms. Uh, I believe it's the Thanksgiving Psalms, and I think it's also in the community rule, where they basically say, you alone are our salvation, uh, we are saved by grace, it's not, you know, basically very similar things what we're seeing to what Paul's saying. There's one thing in the community rule that says, my flesh is utterly sinful, and something like very similar to what Paul's saying. So it's like, well, you know, if you're going to blame Paul, you have to also take into account that the Dead Sea Scrolls say some similar things. So maybe they weren't so different as some people are claiming. And Paul's a whole nother issue. You know, I know there's a lot of people who reject Paul, but I think if you look into more evidence about Paul, more of these extra books, for instance, You'll see that maybe Paul had some ideas that weren't so off, and that maybe he was uh, valid, or you know, at least much closer to the truth than people are claiming he was. Um, and so there's only one more question. I'm going to answer that, and then that's it. Okay? And that question is: uh, Is there any evidence in the Dead Sea Scrolls to support reincarnation? Um, not that I'm aware of. It seems to me that none of these extra books really teach a uh, reincarnation emphasis. What they teach is after you die, you go to you know you go to show uh, to await your punishment or your, your future, to await the, the end times, the, to await the day of judgment when you will be judged for what you did, either good or bad. And uh, I would say there's not. I'm not sure if there's anything in the Dead Sea Scrolls which, like, you know, I, I guess the way to say it is there are people who interpret the New Testament as supporting reincarnation. But it doesn't clearly say reincarnation. Similarly, perhaps, I say perhaps because I don't know for sure, but perhaps the Dead Sea Scrolls can be interpreted by some as supporting reincarnation. But there's nothing clearly supporting reincarnation in the scrolls. And in my view, the idea of reincarnation seems illegitimate to me because the scriptures teach us that everyone when they're resurrected they're not being resurrected into a new body they're being resurrected into their old body uh, their old body is going to reform from all the parts it's going to reform from the dust not like new dust but it's going to be the very dust that you had it's going to reform that's what the scriptures are teaching. And so if you have reincarnation, you're having two different bodies. But you can't have two bodies in the resurrection. 
So which of those two bodies is going to resurrect? Well, you know, that's, a, that's I I iffy. And then there's, a, there's also the idea of um, the purpose of reincarnation. Like some people will say, like, you know, reincarnate to give another chance, things like that. And the problem is when someone reincarnates, they don't remember their former life. I mean, sometimes people have certain memories, but they only remember bits and pieces of certain, like, you know, alleged former lives. Uh, in order for a reincarnation system to really be just, you have to kind of remember what you're being punished for. Because the some people believe, you know, you get punished by getting reincarnated and you have to live another life. But the problem is, if you don't remember what you're being punished for, it seems like it's not right to do that. You know, it doesn't seem like it. Um, how can you repent for something you're not aware that you did wrong? Uh, how can you make yourself better when you don't know your former wrong? So it seems like there's a lot of flaws with the reincarnation system, which it basically kind of makes it like almost like into a mockery of our life that we live. It's like basically, okay, well, you know, I'm going to be reincarnated after I die, so uh, I can just, you know, keep on. I don't have to repent because, you know what, I'm just going to be reincarnated and it's going to be fine. Uh, that's a problem for me because then it takes all the things that scripture says, it, it, it doesn't really take it seriously anymore. It's kind of like, you know, there's some major like warnings of you need to repent to save your soul. Well, you know, if you're just going to reincarnate, then there's really no need to repent because there's nothing really negative that's going to happen to you. Being born isn't something negative, right? It's, it's not, everyone's been born. That, that wasn't negative. Uh, so being born a second time is hardly really a punishment. Uh, it's, you're just getting another life and that's kind of almost like a reward. So, and then, uh, if you've gone through your life already and you've lived it, completed it, it's kind of almost cruel to force the person to go through a, a second life reincarnated because guess what happens? They have to earn their salvation all over again. They earned it the first time, but now the second time they have to, they have to say, you know, they don't remember anything they did, and now they have to overcome sin again. They have to find the truth again. Uh, so what happens if in your first life you're reincarnated and you accept Yeshua, you obey the law, it's all good, and then you get reincarnated, and now you're a pagan. You're you don't you you worship. Uh, other gods and you never find the Torah you you know you never find Yah and you die in your sin well what did that just do you just made in vain the first life you did and when you completed your first life in righteousness you earned you deserved something for yourself you you deserve to have a rest you know rest in peace you deserve that and you shouldn't have to get forced to to do it all over again. That's like, that's like, you know what, that, what that's like. It's like uh, someone you're doing, you're going to school to college. You take a, you take a test. You get like a hundred percent on it, and the teacher says, "Good job. Here's your degree." And they say, "Yeah, yeah, yeah I just graduated from college." And then they, they say, "Oh, wait a minute. You know what? The president of the college has decided, for no reason, but you know, just uh, we're gonna." rip that up uh, because uh, just because and we're gonna put you through the system again we want you to start in the first year and go through that again and uh, get you get, get that degree again we want you to do it a second time uh, well most people would be pretty pissed about that because you know you did that hard work and now that's for nothing and you have to do it all over again uh, that's a complete waste of what you just did so that's how I kind of view reincarnation uh, when you, when you get reincarnated, you start over, and your test, you beat the test, or you fail the test. If, if you fail the test, it's like, okay, well, you're expelled from the college. Uh, and uh, so it's kind of like take, not taking the test seriously almost, you know. So that's kind of how I view it. Um, uh, so I, I don't believe reincarnation is biblical or acceptable, uh, but that you could, I believe you probably could uh, interpret certain passages uh, perhaps as supporting reincarnation in some of these writings. And let me just say this. We cannot deny, and I don't want anyone to do, I don't want anyone to do this. We need to be open to evidence. And there is clearly evidence of people remembering other lives. There's people remembering things that are happening. 
But there can be many explanations of this that does not have to be reincarnation. There are other explanations uh, which I find much more uh, believable, much more consistent with what I've seen, where there's like a model where uh, everyone is coming from the uh, everyone is uh, sorry one sec uh, there's the model of for uh, sorry I lost my train of thought I got distracted because I just saw uh, Jackson left uh, so but so hopefully that explains I mean oh yeah here's what I was going to say there's uh, there's like a computer system okay that I believe where basically um, you can actually get information from other people similar to a download okay so uh, this happens all the time with people where it's coincidences but it's not really coincidences it's actually something that's happening but you're getting information from other people sort of like a download you're downloading information from other sources so you can like let's say you have a mole a mole right here uh, on, on your that you or like a birthmark okay uh, what can happen is that birth birthmark can cause your brain to send out a signal and search for information that's similar so you're looking it's looking for something similar to your life and then it finds something it finds someone's information and that information is someone who had a birthmark in the same place or they I heard a story of you know like someone got killed in that very spot that same spot uh, so it finds that information and then it brings it back to you because it's a similar it's like uh, it's attracting your information is is attracting information that's very similar and so you can actually get thoughts from similar information in the world there's seven billion people someone is bound to have a life story that has some similarities to your situation so I feel like there's a lot of things like that where you can explain reincarnation in a much uh, uh, you can explain these things that people are seeing in a way that does not have to be reincarnation and you don't have to just uh, dismiss the evidence either you don't have to just ignore it and say oh no I, I don't believe that happened I believe these things that they're, they're not lying but they have these thoughts but I don't think it's reincarnation so hopefully that answered the question all right uh, so that's it for uh, that's it for this uh, study I hope you guys will continue to, to come to these things uh, yeah talk to me on Facebook if you want or wh whatever uh, I hope you all enjoyed it thank you and Shalom